Hello, everyone, and welcome to our BTI sponsored book talk with Dr. Kate Jackson Meyer. We are so happy to have her with us. And we are not only honored by her working within the BTI, but she is also a BTI alum. So it's a double honor for us to have uh, her with us today. And uh, before I hand the reins over to hear about this wonderful work, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Jackson Meyer. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University. Her research focuses on issues at the intersection of fundamental moral theology and social ethics. Her current research investigates the problems of tragic dilemmas, moral distress, and moral injury in fields such as bioethics, war, and peacemaking in order to analyze the complexity of moral decision-making and the prospects for community-based moral healing. She is the author of our topic and book today, Tragic Dilemmas in Christian Ethics from Georgetown University Press. And she earned her doctorate in theological ethics from Boston College an MAR in ethics from Yale Divinity School and a BA in biology and religion from the University of Southern California. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jackson Meyer for being here. On a personal note, it's so wonderful to be able to still be in conversation with you in the theological realm. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Kate and I did our doctoral work together at Boston College. So this is just one of the joys of the BTI and the joys of getting to do theology in the Boston area. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Jackson Meyer, would you like to tell us about your book? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards, for inviting me. I'm very much looking forward to this event. Um, as Dr. Edwards said, I did my PhD at BC, and so I was able to benefit from the joys of the BTI and all that it has to offer, and still being in the Boston area, um, it's just such an honor to be able to be here with all of you, and it was just a privilege to share my work and be in uh, conversation and theological dialogue with all of you. All right, so I have a PowerPoint here that I will share. All right, so you should be able to see the slides. All right. Um, so today, uh, Dr. Edwards has asked me to talk to you about my book, Tragic Dilemmas in Christian Ethics. So uh, what I'll do today is um, start out with an introduction, um, and I'm going to start by just kind of giving you a sense of what I understand to be dilemmas, um, and then kind of give you a context of where to understand my book and my work within the theological landscape. Um, from there, I would like to introduce three cases from my book that I think really typify what's happening with dilemmas, um, and I, they showcase the typical strategies that are used to handle hard cases. And I want to make the argument to you today that these um, typical strategies are really not sufficient enough to really handle the complexity of these cases. Uh, from there, I am going to talk about some of the issues that I think the cases raise about the nature of obligations and what we can learn from moral philosophy when thinking about this. Um, and then I'm going to see how we can apply this to Christian thought and show you, you know, what I see a dilemma to be, what I understand a tragic dilemma to be, um, and then in light of this, the, the role of the Christian community to offer healing. Um, I'm going to keep my talk to hopefully around 30 minutes because um, I'm really looking forward um, to some conversation and questions and dialogue with all of you. All right, so just to start, uh, what is a dilemma? So in a dilemma, in a moral dilemma, one ought to do A and one ought to do B, but one cannot do both A and B. And typically a tragic dilemma is a moral dilemma that involves some sort of tragedy. Uh, from the kind of traditional views of philosophy and theology, there's no such thing as a dilemma because you can always make a right choice. And specifically from theology, um, there's been a resistance to accept the possibility of dilemmas because what good God would put us in a situation where we can't make a right choice. Um, so what I want to do today is kind of think about ways in which we could understand why we really should be open to a possibility of what I'm 
specifically focusing on on tragic dilemmas. So I hope that one contribution of the book is to organize a bit of the moral philosophy on dilemmas and to really highlight a distinction between moral dilemmas and tragic dilemmas and then argue specifically for tragic dilemmas. Um, and so just with that kind of brief overview of what dilemmas and tragic dilemmas are, um, I also want to situate this book a little bit. Uh, so the book is assessing aspects of fundamental moral theology, moral action, sin, um, et cetera, through the demands of social ethics and, it co and its commitments to the common good and solidarity. So it has been the case in fundamental moral theology generally that there's been a focus on moral action and individual act actions and individual actors in the case of virtue ethics um, and their decisions in kind of discrete moments in time. Um, but I believe that when we bring the insights of social ethics, our understanding of social structures, when we bring those to bear on an analysis of moral action, the case becomes far more complicated than that. Um, and so I hope that our discussion today, the book, my work in general, um, draws out the ways in which individuals are embedded in society, uh, the different relationships that individuals have, the responsibilities that they have, and the ways in which structures, relationships can constrain moral agents in ways that I think are not properly addressed in typical or standardized ways of looking at these cases and so I want to to expand out you know what that means to really take into account individual agents acting within this greater society and what that means. So just to know where we're going this is the central claim of the book and I hope um, that throughout the course of the conversation I'll be able to make different arguments throughout to kind of convince you or let you know about this position and then we can talk more and see what you think. So the central claim of the book is that in a tragic dilemma, a moral agent chooses between with sufficient knowledge, conflicting non-negotiable moral obligations rooted in Christian commitments to protect human life and the vulnerable and recognized by Augustinian lament. Transgressing a non-negotiable obligation involves wrongdoing that causes great harm and may mar an agent's life, but personal culpability is mitigated so long as the agent acts with Thomistic repugnance of the will and societal culpability is operative when the tragic dilemma is a result of structural sin. In response, Christian communities should offer individual and communal healing after tragic dilemmas. So that's where we're going. Um, so let's see how I got there. So as I said, I'd like to start by looking at some cases. In the book, I talk about nine cases, and today I'd like to talk about three. Um, and these are cases from bioethics and from war um, that really are, there are these very hard decisions. Um, so these are cases that um, involve people deciding how to act when life is at stake. So these are very hard issues. Um, so it's important that we're mindful of what's coming, um, what's at stake here, um, to be in the right mindset for kind of thinking about these kinds of cases. Um, these are cases, as I said, some in war, um, so uh, there's tragedy and violence, so just to, to be prepared for kind of what these cases are, I think that the tragedy involved in them and the difficulty of acknowledging them has contributed to the fact that we don't properly acknowledge dilemmas or tragic dilemmas in theological thought. Um, so just so that we're all, all prepared um, to kind of really delve into these, these difficult and challenging issues. And there are various strategies that moral philosophers and theologians use in order to solve cases such as these, which we're about to talk about. Um, and I'm going to highlight two of these strategies today. One is the principle of double effect and one is ought implies can. And I'm going to show how these strategies are typically used to solve hard cases such as the ones we're going to discuss. And I contend that these are just not sufficient for what's happening in real life. So the first case comes from uh, 
a case in war, so drone warfare and the likely loss of innocent life. This is based on the 2015 film, Eye in the Sky, um, if you saw that, um, and it depicts a situation in which armed forces are planning a drone strike on a compound in a suburb of Nairobi, Kenya, in order to prevent suicide bombers from preparing and initiating an attack. However, outside the compound is a little girl selling bread who will likely die in the blast. Some people in the chain of command try to pass on the decision to someone else because they are reluctant to kill the little girl. The drone pilot tasked to pull the trigger on the attack is especially hesitant. Um, and so in order to understand how this kind of case is usually solved uh, within ethics in general, within just war theory, um, within the thought of Aquinas. Um, we're going to just have to take a little sidestep to understand some parts of Aquinas on moral action. So according to Aquinas, uh, moral action is comprised of three parts. The first is the object, which is the action itself, finis operis, and this is the material action. It's specified what by what the will determines is the end of the action. And it's related to the intention, but it is separate from the intention. The other aspect of a moral action is the intention, finis operantis. Uh, this is the formal part of the action or the heart or the morality of an action. Um, and this is also related to the will. And then there are the circumstances, which is the context the context of the action. So for Aquinas, right actions need to possess a good or neutral object and be done with good intentions and be fitting given the circumstances. So if all of those things are happening, then it would be a right action. An immoral action according to this could occur if somebody's acting with bad intentions, even if the object of the action is good or neutral, or if somebody's acting with good intentions, but the action itself, the object is in and of itself bad. So those are some categories that we have to understand in order to understand how uh, the, a drone strike would be understood usually. All right, the other um, moral strategy that we need to understand is the principle of double effect. And this comes out of a part of the Summa where Aquinas is talking about um, somebody dying in the case of self-defense. Um, and Aquinas says that this could be appropriate or a morally illicit action um, if the per if the death is not intended. And this is because um, Aquinas says that an action can have two effects, those that are intended and those that are beside the intention. Um, from this, something that is now called the principle of double effect developed is not exactly in the way it was in the Summa, but um, it's very important in Catholic moral theology. It's very important in just war theory from um, secular points of view, Christian points of view. Um, so this has become a really important and fundamental ethical principle. And so um, the principle of double, effect, of, of double effect allows for actions where there are unwanted consequences so long as the following occur. So the act has to be good or neutral based on its object, which we discussed. The evil is unintended. The evil effect is not the means to attaining the good. And the good effect is proportionate to the evil cause. Um, so what does this mean? Well, let's go back and look at uh, the drone war case to kind of really understand what these criteria mean. So in the case of the drone strike that I discussed, um, the first part that we want to look at is whether or not the get act is good or neutral. Um, and so in the case of war, um, the drone strike itself is likely justified through just war theory, which is in and of itself um, a whole school of thought, but um, just, you know, assuming that going to war is justified according to what's called use at bellum, right authority, right intention, just cause, reasonable chance of success, last resort, proportionality, um, and then the action within war would need to be justified. Um, so in this case, following the principle of discrimination, being able to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants, um, as well as proportionality. So um, the geopolitics of this particular case are relatively complex, but um, just to understand how this is typically used, we'll grant that this is satisfied. 
The next criteria is that the evil is unintended. And in this case, the evil is the death of the girl who's standing outside of the compound selling bread. Um, and it is absolutely unintended, her death. Um, nobody wants that to happen. Um, if you've seen the film, people involved are very hesitant, true of life and drone strikes. Um, we uh, assume um, that those, those deaths are unintended. Um, and the evil effect is not the means to attaining the good. That is, um, the striking the compound could be done without the death of that girl. It's not inherent to, to this action, to the strike. Um, it could be done without that happening. And then finally, the good effect is proportionate to the evil caused. Um, so this is called in kind of a call callously somewhat, but collateral damage. Um, and so in this case, um, it would be the death of this girl, which is very unfortunate um, compared to the loss of innocent lives that would occur if the suicide bombers were able to go on with their attack. So this is a very classic case of the principle of double effect. And according to this, the drone strike is justified. Um, However, this really raises the question, does this use of the principle of double effect really correspond to moral experience? Is this really um, sufficient for cases at war? Um, and I look at a body of literature called moral injury, and evidence from moral injury suggests this is not always um, how people within the experiences experience morality. So moral injury is, comes out of the field from, of psychology and it's looking at veterans coming back from war who felt as if they have some kind of injury that's more than a bodily injury. It's not PTSD, it's something else about their moral fabric has been injured. Um, and moral injury is a vast literature. Um, it includes all kinds of actions that occur in war, some of nefarious, some are not. Um, but I look at certain cases within moral injury and from that we see veterans coming back from war who are involved in cases that where they followed the principle of double effect, they followed the rules of law and, and they still think, you know, this was supposed to be right, but there is something about it that just doesn't exactly feel quite right. Um, and as ethicists, I think we need to take that really seriously. Um, because their experience doesn't cohere with the tradition, it doesn't necessarily mean that the tradition's wrong, um, but I think we wanna take it really, really seriously, especially um, in the case of war, um, when we have so many veterans coming back with this experience of moral injury. Um, I also worry that um, something like the principle of double effect, um, that's meant to solve a case like the case of just war. Um, it, it's making a claim that this can be justified within the these individual actors and that they can figure it out. And then it ignores the broader social conditions of which war occurs in. And so there's some kind of responsibility, I think, of greater society for war that we don't have, but we don't have to acknowledge that if we um, pretend, if we act like these cases are solved um, very narrowly with a strategy like the principle of double effect. All right, then the next cases I won't go into um, as much detail, um, but I want to bring them up just to to continue to make this point. So another case comes um, from bioethics, an end of life case. Um, so in this case, Mr. C is a 17 year old boy living in the Philippines. He is the eldest of seven children and contributes to his family's income by selling newspapers. He becomes paralyzed from the neck and below after suffering massive injuries from a car accident when going to Christmas mass. The hospital bills accumulate and are unaffordable for the family. After finding out that he would need to be on life support for the rest of his life, Mr. C asks to be removed from the costly ventilator because he knows his family cannot afford it. All right. Um, and a case like this is often solved, again, using the principle of double effect. Um, so I'll just, you know, quickly go through how that works here. So the act is good or neutral. So in this case, removing the ventilator um, in and of itself is... Uh, a neutral act. We don't know what the, you know, we need to learn more um, about what that mean, what that act will mean. The evil is unintended. So um, 
this will inevitably lead to Mr. C's death. Um, that is unintended because the intention is to preserve and protect the family. Um, so Mr. C being on life support, this requiring so much money, um, this is going to take away from his family. Um, it's going to take away from his parents' ability to provide for the family. And so that's really the heart of the intention is to preserve and protect the family. The evil effect is not the means to attaining the good. Um, slightly complicated in a case like this, um, but kind of understanding a distinction between killing versus letting die. Um, or, uh, it's removing the ventilator and then allowing nature uh, to take its course. The good effect is proportionate to the evil cause. So in this case, it's the good of the whole family um, versus um, the life of Mr. C. And so removing the ventilator is considered a justified act. Um, but again, this raises the question, does the use of the principle of double effect correspond to moral experience? And I think the evidence from bioethics suggests not always, even in the case uh, even in the book from which that case arises, the bioethicist analyzing the case, you know, notes that Mr. C's mother was indecisive about how to proceed. Um, and as in kind of many bioethics checks, it just kind of moves on. She wasn't really sure. But really, I mean, we really need to sit and ponder, you know, what that means that this mother um, needs to make this decision. Um, she has to make the decision because Mr. C is a minor. Um, and she has the weight of this decision that she needs to live with for the rest of her life. Um, and so acting as if it's solved through something like the principle of double effect, I think ignores the mother's lived reality. Um, and it also allows us to completely ignore the social structures and realities that force this kind of decision. Um, so, you know, this is forced upon this family due to their situation where they are. It wouldn't be a, a kind of thing that's another family maybe who had more resources in a different country that they would have to deal with. This is a result of unfair distribution of health resources. There are all kinds of reasons why um, society is involved in the fact that Mr. C and his family had to have this choice but the principle of double effect allows us to totally ignore those factors and just focus in on the this particular part of the decision. Um, and I think that's really problematic. Uh, theologian Lisa Cahill at Boston College makes a similar point when analyzing this particular case. And she calls this use of the principle of double effect a self-deceiving abdication of responsibility for the larger factors of unjust resource distribution that force the mother's choice. Um, so we can see, you know, there's starting to be concern in ethics about whether or not these strategies are really enough to deal with these complicated cases and our understanding of the complexity of being people embedded in a social world. And the last case that um, I want to talk about is COVID-19 and resource allocation. Um, obviously, a few years ago, this was a very big topic. Uh, so during the coronavirus pandemic, with hospitals off operating at overcapacity and lacking enough ventilators to serve everyone, hospitals and doctors were forced to make excruciating decisions about who received a ventilator and the chance to live and who did not. This was an especially acute problem early on in the pandemic when ventilators were scarce and thought to be the most optimal intervention. Um, and so for this kind of case, uh, the kind of general philosophical assumption about solving this relies on an acceptance of something called ought implies can. And ought implies can is a moral principle that says that one is only morally obligated to perform duties that one can perform. Uh, so, for example, if uh, an asteroid was going to hit the Earth and only somebody with superhuman strength uh, could um, and flying capabilities could stop the asteroid by flying up and using their super, superhuman strength to move the asteroid. If that's the only way to save the Earth, and if nobody has those capabilities, then nobody's morally obligated to save the Earth 
from the asteroid. Um, and so the benefits of this kind of strategy is that it seems reasonable that people are only morally obligated to do things that they can do. Um, but a weakness of this principle is that it does not always seem to match moral experience. Um, so in the case of the ventilator allocation, um, there were different models of decision making floating around during the pandemic. Uh, Ezekiel, Emmanuel, and colleagues put together um, a view based on utilitarianism of how you would determine which patient should get the ventilator. Daniel Daly wrote for the Catholic Health Association about uh, a um, a way to determine who would get the ventilator based on Catholic principles. Um, and in both of these views, the assumption is, you know, as long as you come up with a reasonable and thoughtful decision-making rubric, you make the best decision and you give the patient who is going to be best suited for the ventilator, um, let's say in this case it's patient A, then you're not morally obligated to give the patient, to give a ventilator to patient B because there is no ventilator. So you can't give it. Um, and then this is essentially solved because the odd implies can. There's no ventilator for the other patient, so you cannot give it. Um, this, you know, still raises the question, does this correspond to moral experience? And evidence from the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic suggests, well, it doesn't always. Uh, Dr. Sadeh Saeed in Massachusetts, he wrote about his experience and he said, nevertheless, I cannot help feel that a crucial part of our humanity will be chipped away each and every time such decisions are actually made. We will not just suffer, suffer deep emotional trauma that might scar us for the remainder of our professional and personal lives, but also violate something basic to the calling of the healing professions. It may not be sacred, but I'm not a embarrassed to call it spiritual. So here he is, you know, using the decision making rubrics that were given to him, um, trying to make the best decision possible. And he's saying, yeah, but um, I feel as if a crucial part of our humanity will be chipped away that, you know, that is um, really important and profound and something that I think that we can't explain away with a principle like ought implies can. So when we look at these cases together, I think we, we start to see some patterns. So they're about conflicting obligations, saving the innocent people who would die in the suicide bombing versus saving the innocent girl selling bread, saving Mr. C or protecting his sibling, saving patient X or saving patient Y. And there's a presumption in all of these cases that you can make a best choice, maybe through the principle of double effect or odd implies can. Um, and that when you do that, when you make the best choice, that obli obligation not chosen for is no longer obligatory. So you have these two obligations. You determine, you know, why this is going to be the best obligation to protect. Um, and then this obligation that you could not choose, it in the theories, it just it falls away. You're not obligated to do to take care of that anymore. Yet, as we saw, this does not always match moral experience, and the strategies are overly focused on individuals ignoring social culpability and the social structures that force these types of questions. Um, and so this raises the question, really, are these cases as neatly solved as the strategies and various traditions have claimed? Um, and again, it's not only because people have this experience where they think that it's not solved. Um, that's not the basis of understanding that the cases might not be solved. They, they, I believe that really should propel us to investigate more about the nature of obligations and really if they do fall away in the way that has always been assumed that they do. So I wanna talk about that briefly. So really, do these unmet obligations fall away? So according to dominant traditional theories of ethics, yes, they do. Um, because if they didn't fall away, they would be in contradiction. So you can't have to do A and not be able to do A. You can't have to do A and cannot do A. Um, and so you have these different strategies that we've talked about as well as others to solve this. Um, but in 1965, in the field of moral philosophy, Bernard Williams said, no, uh, the obligations don't just fall away. Um, 
and there are a variety of reasons and one of this is because they can conflict without being in contradiction so um, for a moral philosopher being in contradiction that would be illogical we don't want to be illogical um, and so Bernard Williams helped kind of think about obligations in a new way and he said that obligations function more like desires than beliefs and I'm going to give you an example of what he's talking about so um, for example, if I believe, if I have a belief that all theologians are friendly and I meet a grumpy person in the parking lot who I just, I'm sure that they're in the theology department, I am forced to forfeit one belief for the sake of not being in contradiction. So either not all theologians are friendly or I did not have a run in with a theologian in the parking lot. Um, and so I can't. I, I need to figure this out. So uh, I go online and I look and uh, look on the website and know the uh, the grumpy person was what's from a different department, uh, political philosophy or something. Just kidding. They're very nice in political philosophy too. We we need political philosophers. But the you take the point. Um, if these are in contradiction, these beliefs, um, I'm going to have to forfeit one belief. But Bernard Williams said that's not the same. Uh, with something like a desire. So he gives the example of wanting to marry Susan and Joan, but he doesn't want to be married to both Susan and Joan. Um, and so let's just imagine that he decides to marry Susan. Um, that also doesn't make his feelings for Joan just disappear in the same way that my belief about friendly theologians would just kind of disappear once I solved uh, the contradiction. So um, this problem, this way that desires work that they can you can want to marry Susan and Joan you don't want to be married to both of them you pick one Susan but you, you still have feelings for Joan um he said that that's how obligations work they're more like that they have this kind of lingering effect they don't just fall away and this is evident in what he calls the regret or the remainder we experience for the obligations not chosen for. So there's this kind of regret or remainder. We can see this um, in the cases. Maybe you can easily imagine Mr. C's mother having a kind of regret or remainder about what happened. Uh, the drone pilot um, having a kind of regret or a feeling of remainder that uh, that girl couldn't be saved. Um, that, that seems to be very evident. Um, and Bernard Williams' work then became fundamental for understanding the possibility of moral dilemmas, but it also raises all kinds of questions. Um, why, um, is, why is it that these obligations do remain in that kind of way? Um, which ones is this for all obligations? Um, so th there are all kinds of questions from this. I want to raise kind of two insights building on Williams work. So the first comes from Rosalind Hurthouse working for moral philosophy and she talks specifically about tragic dilemmas. And she says, however, if a genuinely tragic dilemma is what a virtuous agent emerges from, it will be the case that she emerges having done a terrible thing, the very sort of thing that the callous, dishonest, unjust, or in general, vicious agent would characteristically do, killed someone or let them die, betrayed a trust, violated someone's serious rights, and hence it will not be possible to say that she has acted well. What follows from this is not the impossible of virtue, but the possibility of some situations from which even a virtuous agent cannot emerge with her life unmarred. And so here we start to see something new about the nature of obligations, specifically in a tragic dilemma. So in a tragic dilemma, um, there's something uh, very profound at stake, um, letting somebody die, betray the trust, violating a serious right in her view. And um, when you act in it, you your one's life is marred it's, it's some kind of it stays with you in some kind of way um, building on this idea from Bernard Williams about this this regret she calls it um, a marring and then Lisa Tessman reading from moral philosophy makes a distinction between negotiable and non-negotiable obligations um, and I think that this is quite brilliant so Tessman is essentially saying some obligations do fall away and these are negotiable ones but there are other ones that don't fall away they remain no matter what and these are non-negotiable obligations um, and she um, comes from a different viewpoint than me she builds her case from a constructivist viewpoint um, and she she defines these non-negotiable obligations um, because they um, 
have a have a special value and uh, the cost will be very high of violating this value. Um, but I want to take in, you can you can read more in her excellent book Moral Failure um, about the that and this picture is taken um, from page 44 uh, where she nicely summarizes her views. Um, but I, I want to take from Testament this what I think is quite brilliant distinction between negotiable and non-negotiable obligations, and I see those in Christian thought as well. And so in Christianity, I think that we have many negotiable obligations, but we have a special set of non-negotiable obligations, and these are rooted in Christian commitments to human dignity and human vulnerability, um, and these arise from the Imago. We can see that in scriptural. Um, accounts of the Imago Dei, Matthew 25 and the parable of sheep and goats, the Good Samaritan, various parts of Catholic social teaching. Um, and so these uh, then are special non-negotiable obligations. And then when those are at stake, they do not fall away um, in the way that a negotiable obligation can. And so this is what I see to be um, the foundation of a tragic dilemma. So in a tragic dilemma, we have these non-negotiable obligations that are at odds with each other, and you make the best choice you can, you choose one, but this one that's not chosen for, it still remains, and there's still a kind of moral responsibility that we have for them because they arise from these really fundamental Christian commitments to human dignity or human vulnerability. Um, and because of that, then we have a special kind of moral responsibility for these unmet obligations. Um, and this is both an individual moral responsibility and a social moral responsibility. So I understand the individual moral responsibility in light of feminist insights about a relational autonomy um, and the way that our relationships with others um, mean that we have some kind of special commitments to one another. Um, and um, feminists don't generally want to expand moral responsibility in this particular way I'm doing it, um, but I think that this appreciation and feminist thought for relational autonomy helps us understand why we have special obligations to others to so that um, the special obligations that Mr. C's mother has to Mr. C, but even, you know, the obligations we have to one another, um, like uh, the drone pilot and the drone strike. Um, and this moral responsibility is mitigated so long as one acts with what Aquinas calls repugnance of the will, which I think is a very um, evocative phrase and it describes exactly what it it means um, repugnance of the will. You're doing something that you don't want to do. Um, in a different circumstance, you wouldn't do it. You're doing it because you think you ought to. It's the best choice in this circumstance, but it's something that you'd rather not do. And if one has repugnance of the will that this mitigates personal responsibility. Um, and the, in the book, I have a chapter on Aquinas um, and where I get more into to this, which I'd be happy to talk about more during the questions as well. Um, and then, um, as I said, moral responsibility is not just for individuals, but also a kind of social moral responsibility in light of social sin and structures of injustice that often force these decisions. So then in light of this, I have then the central claim of the book, revisiting that, um, which is that in a tragic dilemma, a moral agent chooses between with sufficient knowledge. So this is um, the kind of knowledge that Aquinas talks about, um, about having a kind of enough knowledge to make a decision that would allow for moral responsibility. So sufficient knowledge. So in the case of the drone strike, they they know that it's very likely um, that the girl is going to be harmed in the strike. This is sufficient knowledge. It's not a, um, her death is not a consequence that was totally unforeseen. Um, so, there, so in a tragic dilemma, moral agent chooses between conflicting non-negotiable obligations, as I have defined those, rooted in Christian commitments to protect human life and the vulnerable, and recognized by Augustinian lament. Um, and so this kind of sadness um, that I think that Augustine talks about in relation to obligations. There's a chapter on Augustine in the book, and again, something we could talk about more during the questions if there is interest. Um, and transgressing a non-negotiable obligation involves wrongdoing that causes great harm and may mar an agent's life in the way that uh, Hearst House talks about that. But personal culpability is mitigated so long as the agent acts with Thomistic repugnance of the will, 
know, doing something that they'd rather not do, but determining that that's the best action. And societal culpability is operative when the tragic dilemma is a result of structural sin in the way that, um, you know, the cases that we saw, um, agents are constrained or for forced into these situations due to societal forces that are far outside of themselves. And in response, Christian communities should offer individual and communal healing after tragic dilemmas. And so in the last chapter of the book, I talk about considerations for Christian communities to offer healing. And I think that it's really important for Christian communities to recognize um, that people in their community may have gone through these kinds of situations where they made hard choices, acted in the best way possible, um, and that there's still a kind of pain from that. And so I think it is absolutely necessary for the Christian community to offer healing and also acknowledge our own um, involvement in these structures that cause these situations. Um, and this attention to tragedy that the tragic dilemma shows, um, this I think is a something that Christians are able to do because we can acknowledge this great tragedy in light of our great belief in God's forgiveness and God's redemption. And it's very important then for the Christian community to acknowledge this and to respond appropriately. Um, and so the community um, needs to be a part of this healing and and i talk about that um one kind of point to know is that also part of this is to say that within the christian view the only kind of thing that can really be considered that a dilemma is a properly tragic dilemma so it's not as if um everything is a dilemma and we can never make any choices it's that there are these special kind of cases where there are hard choices to make um and recognizing those as such, uh, being attentive to the needs of people that make those choices, and then um, being responsive as a community to those people's needs, as well as recognizing how we ourselves are part of, part of causing this in many cases. And, um, and so tragic dilemmas, I think, are tragic for many reasons. They involve situations where these non-negotiable obligations cannot be met. And so tragedy ensues um, because life is lost or people are left vulnerable. Uh, they require that otherwise good agents perform moral transgressions in an attempt to act the best way possible. And they're often a result of unjust structures where harm is systematic and thus tragic. They often produce wounds that moral agents must ca carry. And the value of a, the category of tragic dilemmas is that it reveals these harms in all of their various forms. And without this category, I worry that hurt and destruction goes and has gone unnamed, unnoted, and even covered up by moral strategies that claim to solve hard cases. It's only after this harm is brought to light that healing can begin, and it is incumbent on the Christian community to support restoration and recovery. This involves those involved in tragic dilemmas, as well as transforming the social structures that often cause these tragedies. So thank you so much um, for listening today, and I um, really look forward to having a conversation. Thank you. Wow, Kate, thank you so much. Um, it's just such a joy to see you in this work still and to see you really um, expanding upon these. I, I agree um, with your rousing closing statement, um, these really necessary categories. Um, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask the first question. Um, I, in, in looking at your like paradigms for action, we could call it at the end, um, for Christian communities, I was thinking about how deeply necessary those actions are, even within a community that doesn't have such an extremity of experience. Um, I'm thinking about how, when, it, when you were talking about from Hearst House, this, the marking, um, and I was thinking about how even outside of a particular tragic dilemma, I am in community now that feels deeply marked by a almost social level tragic dilemma that I didn't have to make the ventilator decision, but I felt culpable to be a part of a society that ended up in that situation to begin with. 
And it's that I think potentially that I, it's now Lent. <laughs> um, but I would love if you could speak a little bit more about how you see those potentially in a new way in our current moment and how you're thinking about the ways that they can look in communities, um, even if you've experienced it yourself in some way. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. And I appreciate that. And I know you've done so much important work on trauma. And um, so I, I really appreciate where that's coming from. Um, yeah. I. So part of it is exactly what you're saying is I want to say that um, other, we all, when a Christian community is looking at itself, we are culpable. Like there is a social culpability um, and I don't think that that's been acknowledged as much and it needs to be just to be able to say, yeah, we are involved in that. Um, that is, uh, we, we have some kind of guilt um, and to understand that. And then to think really deeply and concretely about changes to be made. Um, so in the chapter that I, I um, where I address this, you know, I'm really thinking about literally concrete changes that a community can think about within their own context, so that'll look different. So if it's, um, you know, depending on what their resources are in their location, you know, thinking about their relationship to that. So, you know, where I live, um, outside of Boston, you know, I'm right near a hospital, just for example, you know, so my community could really take that seriously that we're just miles away from a hospital. We're also miles away from a prison. Um, you know, so these are some things that we, that I think should really be taking it into account when we're really thinking as a community to say, wow, you know, this happened. So we have, since there's a hospital here, we both have frontline workers in our community, uh, but we also have um, the needs of the hospital, the needs of the prisoners right here. And we need to just acknowledge um, our part in this and then really think like what we specifically can do given our location and our sp specific resources um, and think about how that might really look as well as um, kind of other policy changes that we might think about at a bigger scale, but really, um, being brave enough to bring to the community that, yeah, we do have some kind of social responsibility here, some kind of culpability, and now let's really look at where we are and what we should do. And that wouldn't be an easy conversation. The answers wouldn't be easy. There wouldn't be one answer. Um, but even starting that and making a way forward, I think, would be really beneficial. Amazing. Yeah, and I agree. <laughs> let, it, let us work towards that. Um, I have a question in the Q&A um, from a dual degree student at BU doing social work and, and a, um, what are you doing social work? And theology, of course. Why else would you be here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they would like you to talk a little bit more about the conflict with and contradiction difference because they are seeing that in their um what did they say? They're seeing it in their internship, in their social work internship. Um, and they, they would love if you would detail that a bit more because they think it might be helpful for um, their guiding some of the people that they're working with in complicated situations. Great. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it's um, relatively complex and I did kind of go through that quickly so I appreciate that. So um, one of the main ideas within moral philosophy about why there can't be a dilemma is a great concern that if we're saying there's a dilemma um, that these um, the two they could be more than two but we'll say two obligations are in contradiction with each other. So um, I ought to help patient A um, and I ought to help patient B, like in the case of the ventilator. Um, but then are we saying I ought to help patient B, I ought to help patient A, but I ought not help patient A or I ought not help patient B as well um, in light of the fact so that these are in conflict. So are we saying um, something that's an exact contradiction, I ought to do A and I ought not do B, or um, what Williams is trying to say is that they're not logically at odds. Um, so you can hold, so this is a question, can you hold these two things together and say something that makes any sense at all um, or not? And so he was trying to say um, they're not um, in 
you're thinking he's saying like moral philosophy is thought they're in contradiction they're totally at odds with each other um, because you've been thinking of them like beliefs in the way that you know I can't hold two contrary beliefs so I can't um, think that in my example I can't think that theologians are grumpy and that uh, Dr. Edwards is a theologian if I thought you were grumpy. Luckily, you're not, right? Um, I, that would be impossible for me to say that that's a contradiction. Um, we all know lots of people that hold contradictions, right? <laughs> um, but um, at least logically, they shouldn't hold contradictions, right? So why that is, is its own complicated thing. Um, so Williams came in and he wanted to say, no, they're not actually in contradiction because it's not that um, I think all theologians are grumpy and I think that this grumpy person is a theologian, which is at odds. It's more like I have feelings for Joan and I have feelings for Susan. We can understand that, right? So Williams was saying, I want to marry Susan and I want to marry Joan. So we can see that seems to make more sense to us. Um, just because you have feelings for Susan doesn't mean you don't have feelings for Joan anymore. Um, so that's one way. So he's trying to say, we've been thinking about it wrong. They're not in contradiction. They're things that are in conflict, right? I can't marry Susan and Joan, um, but they're not actually, it's not not true anymore just because I had feelings for Susan that I don't have feelings for Joan. Um, so that's what he's trying to get at. He's trying to give um, philosophers a way of talking about these obligations that still seem to follow some kind of logic. Um, there are other people that weigh in on this discussion too and other ways of trying to figure out how they're not in direct contradiction. The other strategy is just to say they are in contradiction and I don't really care. That would be another way that, yep. Um, so that, um, and, and a little bit, um, Williams a, a little bit pushes in, in that direction. He goes through all kinds of ways that people might disagree with him and he maybe opens up a little bit for for that these things could actually be in contradiction. Um, certainly as Christians, we believe in paradoxes, right? Um, so there might be within Christianity a way to maybe hold something as strong as a contradiction together. It might not actually be problematic. Uh, so there are different kinds of ways of solving what was the main problem for having a dilemma that this was just illogical and so somebody like Kant is like well we couldn't possibly have something illogical going on um, and so that's what Williams was trying to solve by bringing that in um, other people weigh in on it but then yeah this other strategy would just to say well I don't really care thank you and and that makes so much sense I think that that's a really helpful um, or I can imagine it being helpful for me when I'm sitting with a student, a colleague, whoever it is, and they're have, having a real life experience, <laughs> which is contradiction, like it is, it's to say that, or conflict, whichever word you want to use, both can be true. And to have that kind of language within philosophy and theology, like in formal categories, and be able to push that into our decision making is one it's obviously a great building block for what you've done in this book but also is very helpful just to to me on a practical level because it often can feel and and I don't I don't know if you felt this in your uh, writing because you're writing with classic figures like Augustine and Aquinas the, those are the the guys you know and it can feel or has felt to me in my professional development sometimes that the rigidity that not necessarily the, those authors intended, but the ways in which they've been interpreted throughout history can in itself become a constraint that doesn't allow for human action. Because <laughs> as you pointed out throughout your work, human action is deeply, deeply complicated. Um, and so to, I think to lift that up, I'm so glad that student was focusing on that because I do think that that is uh, so attuned um, to not just like work in the world, but potentially working with these titans um, of theology and, and how they've been, how we are receiving them, you know, through the, through the ages. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and that, um, and I take up these different ways that I don't think Aquinas is as rigid as um, he has been interpreted, that there are places where he acknowledges more complexity um, mm -hmm. that he's been given credit for in my uh, view, but yeah, the interpretation has really been that he wouldn't possibly allow for a dilemma, and a lot of that comes from a Kantian read of Aquinas, 
Um, but yeah, to say, yeah, there is, um, I think, yeah, more space in these people like um, Aquinas and Augustine to really, you know, when, when you see, when you get this great insight from somebody like Bernard Williams to go back um, and read, you know, read the text in light of those insights, you know, I went back and read the text in light of these insights from Tessman. And then, yeah, I think, I hope that the book is really kind of pulling out new insights from that to say, yeah, there's more resources in these thinkers than we maybe give them credit for. Do they have a full-fledged theory of tragic dilemma? No, um, but is there more nuance there? Um, is there more that we can really build with? Absolutely. Yeah, and I love that for, I mean, for all of us, right, that's the task in theology, um, but I think particularly back to my seminary years, and I think about, I, I, it's, it was a struggle to get to risk or small, right? It was a struggle to be like, can I find something in these ancient texts because I, for a while, because I'm a very modern ethicist, um, at, at my core was like, no, <laughs> you know, the, the resistance kind of went up. And so I think your work is deeply refreshing to me because I can put myself back in my seminary years and say, hey, if I had gotten the, these lenses to see Augustine and Aquinas through, potentially I would have um, dove in with a bit more excitement that I would have said, oh, maybe I can uncover new things and not just have to receive the wisdom, but can kind of discern through it myself. So um, in reading your book and seeing this current stage, um, final form maybe, <laughs> um, it's so, I just wanna thank you for that because I think that that's one of the gifts of your writing and one of the gifts of the ways that you've approached tragic dilemmas because in in, in modern ethics, you can kind of start from wherever you want. <laughs> and that's a good, that's, that's good. It's creative. But to use these titans of Western theology and say, actually, I do think even their thought is formative in how we approach this. Um, yeah, just thank you for that because it's great. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, so I have one final question if you have time to, to ask or to answer it. Um, from a student at Hebrew College. Um, you've spoken, of course, about your background as a Catholic theologian and in Christian communities. Have you worked in uh, secular or interreligious settings where you think that this could be a useful tool? Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, I hope the book in general is a contribution to debates about dilemmas that are in moral philosophy and secular thought. Um, so I think just in general, the contribution of thinking about uh, a really big difference between moral dilemmas and tragic dilemmas, I hope that that is really helpful in and of itself. Um, and I think, um, so one of my areas of interest is bioethics, which um, has a lot of interreligious opportunities. Um, so one thing that I've looked at and want to continue working on is thinking about these categories for healthcare workers and then using uh, different particular religious identities as ways to discuss this more in light of the diverse diversity in healthcare. Um, so um, looking at kind of spiritual interventions um, in light of these. So I've um, done a little bit of work looking at different um, um, ways of thinking about dilemmas um, in Hinduism and taking that and seeing how there might be resources to offer healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think also just um, in the healthcare setting as well, just being able to have secular conversations right. um, is uh, that, the, that this is part of that. So um, there's another area that I'm working on now called moral distress, which is related to dilemmas um, in healthcare workers. And so I am co-organizing a conference at Boston College on March 24th on moral distress, um, which so it's related to this and that's using, um, there's a bit of spirituality, but it's also using insights from the liberal arts. So um, in that sense, applying it here, it's like seeing the university as a community and that there are different strengths of the university um, and so how the liberal arts can be a way of delving into these difficult decisions. So how, so in there, we're using these very creative modalities, music, writing, reading, you know, how can that help you in your moral discernment? How can that help you to understand a situation, to understand these categories? Like we just, in the earlier question, I mean, just like kind of figuring out the different categories is helpful in and of itself. Um, and so 
so that conference um, has both secular and religious parts as well that I um, that builds on this kind of work. That's amazing. And I'm so glad that that's happening and we'll definitely promote it through the BTI. <laughs> it's open. <laughs> Great, um, but yeah, we'd love to do that. And I just like to thank you again for your time and for your incredible work. And um, alongside the conference, I'm just so excited to see this coming to life and to see that those um, prescriptions and those ideas for action at the end are already happening through you and I'm sure other people, but that's so exciting. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me, Dr. Edwards. The BTI is just uh, an amazing, amazing consortium and an amazing resource. Um, you know, and so it's just, it was a privilege to be able to be here. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. And for those of you watching, we will um, record this as we have, and we will post it to our YouTube channel and put it out through our newsletter. So if you want to revisit any of Dr. Jackson Meyer's work and any of her wonderful reflections, you'll be able to do so in about a week. Great. So thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.